hypnosis, you know, it, it, it has been dissed for so long. It's the first Western conception of a psychotherapy, the first time a talking interaction was thought to have therapeutic potential. That's pretty cool all by itself. And yet it has been dissed in a million ways. People either think it's horribly dangerous and it makes people into zombies uh, or it's ridiculous and does nothing. You know, they really kind of get it right in the middle where it's a powerful state of highly focused attention that people can use for all kinds of therapeutic and life changing benefits. The fact that it hasn't disappeared over more than 200 years suggests that there's something really interesting there that we got to pay attention to. And uh, so that's what I have devoted my career to doing. And <laughs> I've heard you talk a bit about how the people on stage, right? Like, you know, I'm going to go to some event and they're going to get me to cluck like a chicken or dance around or stuff like that. Like, first of all, and I, I honestly don't believe it, but you know, the people who are up there doing it, you know, I, I kind of feel like they're plants or people can't really be hypnotized or you can't really get me to do things that I don't want to do. But, but even that stage stuff, like it's a real thing, right? Oh yeah. Any, anything that has the power to help has the power to hurt. And there's one trick that the stage hypnotists use that most people don't quite get. And that is they don't just grab the first person in the audience and do all this stuff with them. The first half of every show is bringing people up, trying a few things on them and having most of them sit back down again. And so they wind up with out of a whole audience of a couple hundred people, maybe five or 10 who are extremely hypnotizable. So we vary in our hypnotizability. It's as stable a trait in adult life as IQ is. And they're looking for the ones who are the most extreme high hypnotizables. And then they do the show with them. Um, one example, for example, is it was a woman uh, who they did something they thought was quite innocent with. Um, he had her up there. He had her hold an imaginary birdcage in her hand and said, uh, now you're going to open the door and let the bird fly away. That sounds pretty innocent. And she started to scream and cry. And he had to just get her off the stage. And she was actually found wandering around the streets of Manhattan at two in the morning. And it turned out that she was the trophy wife of a very wealthy man who felt like a bird trapped in a golden cage. And the bird wouldn't leave. She interpreted it in her way in her life, which was, I'm trapped here and I can't get out. And so, yes, it can really happen. And every once in a while, something bad can happen. Uh, but it, there's more to it going on than you would recognize. And I don't like stage hypnosis. I don't like making fools of people. I don't like taking advantage of people. And uh, but we understand part of why it can happen, that when you're deeply engaged in hypnosis, you're so focused on the central part of your experience that you're not thinking about consequences. So it's a kind of cognitive flexibility. It can be used for good, but it can also be used for bad. Hell, you know, two thirds of Republican adults in the United States think that Trump won the presidency. Now, that's worse than hypnosis could possibly do, I think. But, um, you know, we are always susceptible to social input. You know, we can suspend critical judgment and accept things that just flat out aren't true. Um, and so. Um, this is just a different kind of example of that general human tendency, but we can use it for good rather than for ill. You have got to hear the whole conversation I had with Dr. David Spiegel. We talk about how hypnosis can help you overcome anxiety. It can help you battle fears. It can help you hit that next level. Be sure to click on the link right over there to hear the full conversation.